operations in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Since 2004, he's been based in, in Beirut, Lebanon, where he supervises and manages CRS staff, operations, programming, partnerships, and resource stewardship in 10 countries in the Middle East and Europe. Managing an annual budget of more than 35 million, he provides support uh, and programming in disaster preparedness and response, refugee assistance, youth civic engagement and volunteerism, peace building and counter trafficking. From 2000 to 2003, Schnellbacher served as country representative for Belgrade, Serbia, and uh, deputy regional director and regional director for Europe. He holds a BS in International Foreign Service from Georgetown University, studied at Harvard Divinity School, the Kennedy School of Government, and the Kroc Institute for International Peace at Notre Dame University. He speaks Thai, German, and Mandarin. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Um, I thought I'd make a few remarks to, to pivot off of what Jack was talking about. Um, about the changing humanitarian space in which we work, um, especially in complex humanitarian emergencies. Most of my experiences with man-made or political disasters, not, not natural disasters, I was in the Balkans for most of the, the wars of Yugoslav succession, and Bosnia and whatnot, Kosovo, and then uh, the last 10 years dealing with uh, the Middle East, including Iraq and the American war there. Um, and so I thought we would just talk about uh, how humanitarian space is, is shrinking, and it's becoming more porous, and it's becoming more crowded. Um, it's, not surprised, it's not surprising, I don't think, that it's especially becoming more crowded, uh, because it is, like Jack said, uh, a very big business uh, nowadays. Um, easily $40 billion a year, if, depending on where you draw the lines for it. And more than that, it's a... Uh, it's a high, there's high stakes involved um, because of the power that comes with the control of resources, particularly in conflicts. I mean, if you control food, if you control access to food, access to clean water, access to health care, everybody wants to uh, try to control you, whether you're the government or uh, an insurgency group or a militia group or a group of warlords. There's a great, everybody wants to get a, get a hand on you. And organizations like CRS um, spend a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to protect the space uh, within which we work, trying to protect uh, uh, important, important ethical but also important practical concepts like impartiality, like neutrality because it's not just because that's the tradition of humanitarian assistance that we want to pass on to those who follow us, but because these two ethical, what I'll call ethical principles, are the, th the very things that, that protect us in this shrinking space. Um, so to the size of the humanitarian space in which we work, um, it's shrinking. Uh, it's shrinking substantially, I would say, certainly since the last 20 years that I've been involved in this business. And it's shrinking for a number of a number of reasons. One, I think generally there's less respect for and decreasing adherence to international humanitarian law, such as that that's laid out in the Geneva Conventions. Um, for example, the US's, uh, US military's actions in Iraq, which sort of very much confused what is humanitarian aid, what is a military support mission. Jack talked a little bit about uh, the uh, involvement or the intrusion of, uh, of uh, military forces into humanitarian space. We're going to do a session on that, so I don't want to get into that here, but that's certainly one of the actors that have become much more involved uh, in, in humanitarian action and humanitarian space, both foreign, for, foreign military forces as well as local uh, uh, military forces uh, uh, associated with governments. Um, another example of shrinking of, of less respect for international humanitarian law are situations such as Darfur, or currently in the Syrian civil war, where you have the government, either in Khartoum or Damascus, uh, which is perpetrating human rights and which is, in, uh, which is prosecuting a war, uh, but also at the same time pulling 
all, if not all, most of the levers of humanitarian assistance. Who can come into the country? Who can, who can work in the country? Who's given visas? Whose goods are let in? So that the government is both perpetrating human rights abuses, but also uh, significantly controlling what response might be possible. Um, there's, a, there's a paradox at work, thirdly, uh, and it's the paradox of greater media attention, the so-called CNN effect, uh, but also more recently, sort of the use by activists of social media. So there's more and more attention to quiet disasters um, that may not get uh, much or sustained media attention from sort of the mainline media. But at the same time, that sort of temporarily shrinks the space in it, in that it places m many more demands on us to get something done quickly and it constrains us or at least makes it more difficult to make sure that we do the proper kind of assessments, have the proper kind of relationships in place because there's this news-driven demand, do something, do something now because you see the horrible suffering right in front of your face or many, many people do, or, or wait, people who are outside the, the zone of humanitarian disaster see it and they want to see something done. So there's the flip, the good side is these uh, the coverage that is given to these uh, these disasters, often which uh, don't get it otherwise, the downside is it does put pressure on, on those working inside the humanitarian space. Um, also, I think it's th there's the, the rise of militias and non-state political actors, uh, such as groups like Hamas in, in Gaza, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, uh, there were the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka before that civil war was uh, was uh, completed, um, FARC in, in Colombia. These groups that are not signatories to any of the conventions, international treaties that regulate the laws of war, um, and they're, they're not sort of in the diplomatic circuit. Uh, they don't have representation uh, at, at UN, uh, in UN bodies. So they're sort of a, an animal that's very important uh, in, in humanitarian space, and yet uh, the international structure hasn't really kept up with how to incorporate them formally or, or legally into, into this. Okay. Um, is this better? It seems not to be. It seems not to be singing. And you don't have to lean into the microphone. It's picking you up well. Okay. Thanks. Um, so we have the we have these uh, these non-state uh, non-state political actors and mili military actors, which are now uh, many uh, much more often found in inside the humanitarian space. There's also new laws and regulations. It's not just sort of these non-state actors. Governments uh, are behaving in a different way towards uh, the the international humanitarian regime excuse me, regime to which they've signed up. Uh, particularly important in this regard for an organization like Catholic Relief Services is uh, the Patriot Act and all things post 9-11 uh, and how they have affected how we work with the uh, designated foreign terrorist organizations and, and the like. This has really put a great deal of pressure on us because it regulates or tries to regulate uh, for probably good reason, uh, um, our involvement with what are considered to be uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, so for example, both the United States government and the EU governments consider Hamas uh, a foreign terrorist organization. And yet Gaza is the most densely populated place on the planet, tremendous humanitarian need surrounded on two sides by Israel, one side by Egypt, all three essentially sealing it off. Controlled by Hamas is the de facto, that's what it's called, the de facto government. Um, and yet, it's our intercourse with them, because of the, it's designated as a foreign terrorist organization, is extremely difficult and risky. I mean, potentially, uh, I or my colleagues could, could go to prison because we, have to contact them. You cannot not talk to the governing, the sovereign of, of, of a country. I mean, even if it's just to arrange for your vehicle to be registered and get a license plate, 
or to pay a registration fee of 10 Israeli shekels. Any kind of intercourse, including the kind I've just described, those simple administrative procedures, is technically a violation of, of the U.S. laws which govern uh, um, foreign <laughs> terrorist entities. So we devise sort of ways and sort of send the clerk to get the to get the license plate. But I mean, it's not possible. I mean, just think the think about it practically. How can you not talk to the mayor? How can you not talk to the people who control the water supply or the public public health system or the hospitals? You have to have intercourse with them to do your work, and yet, in doing so, you potentially are bringing the wrath of, of the um, U.S. government down on top of you. A related thing is something called the partner vetting system, which has been introduced consequent to the, uh, the Patriot Act. This is an attempt by U.S. Congress and Homeland Security to make sure, reasonably, to make sure that f official U.S. government funding is not going to people who would do harm to the United States. Makes sense. Problem is, uh, in the Muslim world, the number of people named Muhammad Muhammad is very large. <laughs> very large. Millions of people named Muhammad Muhammad. Uh, and so to have to screen all of these people uh, to make sure that they are not uh, the Muhammad Muhammad who doesn't like us and who wants to do us harm is both um, very onerous and time consuming and also, in the case of that particular name and, and many others, a lot of false positives come out. So we spend a lot of bureaucratic time just trying to get through this process. Others do not want to have their names in the massive national security system that our government runs you know, in, in Maryland. They don't want to be, have their name in, in that system. And for example, the 72-year-old uh, woman who is the head of Caritas Catholic Charities in Jerusalem refuses to uh, work with CRS to take U.S. government funding from USAID because she refuses to have her name as an executive officer of Catholic Charities in Jerusalem, Caritas Jerusalem, she refuses to have her name put into our national security apparatus. She has children in, she's a very well-born uh, um, Catholic elderly woman who has children living in the United States and in Western Europe, and she's like, look, Mark, I don't want to be planning a trip to go see my kids in Washington and, and be denied boarding on a flight because my name popped. I'm just not willing to risk it. It's not worth it. Plus, there's issues. There's, there's deeper or more basic issues that, you know, the money's not worth it. Feel, uh, sort of on an ethical or principled basis. Like, the money's not worth it. If this is what we've got to do, thank you very much. We'll go to the Norwegians. Now, luckily, this doesn't affect our private funding, which we get from people like you. It affects only U.S. government funding. But it, it is, you can see, an intrusion on the humanitarian space where for even if for legitimate reasons the U.S. government is, is getting its hands on and quite, with quite a tight grip on how humanitarian assistance is offered. Um, and and it, it plays out very practically in those ways. I was in Lebanon when the Israeli Hezbollah war was fought five years ago, six years ago now. Um, we regularly went to the south of Lebanon, which is Hezbollah land. I mean, they control the entire south of, along the Israeli border. And we, but the U.S. government couldn't go there because of security concerns. They didn't barely, they barely left their embassy, which is north of Beirut. We were able to go there. They were interested in having us go there because we were one of the main, not just CRS, but other NGOs, was an important contact about what was happening down there. Well, the only way to do programming is to talk to, as I said, mayors and school teachers and others who live in the communities. Well, everybody down there has a job because of Hezbollah. Technically, they're all Hezbollah. Technically, I can't talk to them. Well, in that case, you can't do program. The irony was that then you would see the people from the embassy at a cocktail party or something, and they're most interested in hearing what did you see on your last trip down there, and you met this mayor of this Hezbollah mayor of this place or that place. And again, it gets into the problem, and in, in that in itself, in an indirect way, deals with the 
or intrudes upon the humanitarian space because of the associational risks. Jack mentioned the iPad and, you know, you're a spy. Well, in the Middle East, if you're an, if you're an American working in the Middle East, everyone thinks you're a spy. It, it's just, you know, it's a matter of how good of, how good of one are you or not. <laughs> you, you just have to assume everybody's going to think you're a spy. But you don't want to do anything that sort of can be construed to give credence to that suspicion. And so if you're seen to be an informant about what's happening in South Lebanon in Hezbollah villages where U.S. Embassy people won't go or can't go, this is the kind of difficulty that sort of it muddies or messes up uh, the, the humanitarian space. I think it's important to say, we, you know, we, we need to realize that this, you know, we, we can't be naive and sort of try to retain, return the humanitarian state to some virginal place where it may or may not have been 50 years ago when, you know, when it was really only the Red Cross that was operating. I mean, the humanitarian space has always been a muddy, messy, bloody place. The problem is it's just getting more and more small. And there are many more people who are trying to manipulate those of us who are, who are in it. And so we spend a lot of our time, both sort of intellectual time, but also advocacy time and time on the ground in meetings trying to push back and trying to keep this space. Different agencies have taken different positions on how to do this, but it's in the interest, I think, in the over, for the, the entire enterprise and those of us who are working in it to try to resist these continuing incursions. I, I think, Jack, I think you'd agree with me that we're, we're not winning this battle. Um, and it's become particularly difficult in the last uh, in the last ten years for reasons, some of the reasons for which we'll talk about when we talk about the military's involvement in it. But it's not just the military that is um, that is that is in there sullying the you know making it more difficult uh, for us to to deal in this space. So that's that's sort of my my read of why this this place is getting smaller in size. It's also getting much more crowded. It's much more porous than it used to be. It's very easy for people and groups and whatnot to, to come in and to come out at different times. Uh, so you've got a lot more players in this space in any given con conflict or disaster zone, um, which makes coordination, which we've never done well at all, except talk about it well, uh, even more complicated, because now you've got people coming in from all over the place. Uh, and it, it, it really used to be 25 years ago that there would be a war or a, a flood or a disaster, and you could count on two hands who would be in the room. You know, CARE, Save the Children, CRS, Oxfam UK. It was, it was very clear. People knew each other. Well, now there's this plethora of, of organizations and individuals who are, who are involved. I mean, Haiti and the earthquakes, a perfect example of it, where churches from the middle of uh, Nebraska, one church was sending a mission to Haiti. And then multiply that by 10,000. And now with the internet and what, and social media and whatnot, anybody can have an NGO. Anybody. The registration requirements in this country to found one, you know, register with the, the tax department are not that onerous. So anybody can have one. Uh, with communications with overseas and the way people travel, you know, you, everybody's got a friend who lives overseas, right, that you've met on travel or their travel here. So th there's this burgeoning um, group of, of organizations who, who are now in this, uh, largely for good reasons, certainly for good intent. But my point is, is not to, to judge their work, but rather just to say they're, they're one of the factors in crowding, crowding the field. Um, there's also a great increase in advocacy and activist groups. So CRS is more sort of on the, the humanitarian service side. There's also many, many more activist groups who are, who are uh, like uh, you know, Human Rights Watch and groups like this that are trying to influence government policies who are now in the ground during the conflict zone. Um, there's now donor representatives. Governments now, they don't wait in Washington to get your report back. The U.S. government has, a, has an organization within USID called the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. They put people on the ground in the middle of the disaster. So they're there. We've also got some new donors in the last decade who become involved in this, particularly uh, the Gulf states. 
are now very active. Uh, they tend to be a little parochial and tend to help only disasters or war in Muslim majority countries, but they're becoming a major player. Turkey is now a major player in providing assistance. And I think we're gonna see this more from India, from Brazil, as, as these economies grow and they wanna have more of a role in the world, they're gonna get involved in this as well. Um, there's not for us or for many, NGOs, but for some, security for uh, secure private security contractors in the in the field. We, you know, we sort of take the no guns, no security uh, position, but not everybody does. So you've got these people who are not regulated military forces under a command and control system, but rather uh, um, these groups that we saw in in Iraq, for example. Jack mentioned the corporate world is now quite involved in this because it is so lucrative and, and profitable. Um, and then I mentioned during one of my responses these hybrid groups that are now. So all of these different, and the media, I mean the media is there but I'm not going to talk about it because one of my colleagues will later. But So you've got all of these different people who've got different purposes now inhabiting this smaller and smaller space. We do trip over each other, I think we have to admit that. There is unfortunate duplication, but the whole environment in which we work is becoming much more confused and complex, and I think it takes a great deal more sophistication to work within it successfully than it did when I first joined CRS 25 years ago. I mean, you could get away with being naive uh, 25 years ago. Now it's sort of dangerous, literally dangerous, and probably ineffective to be naive because of this these changes in the space in which we work. That's all I have to say for now. Do you want to do questions or do we want to go to the next session? Questions? Yes. Um, all of these uh, NGOs and hybrid organizations, is there some um, positioning and what upsmanship that happens on the ground in some of the countries that um, you've been working in or that your colleagues have? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, there is. Um, I mean, CRS is kind of fortunate in that we are not entirely, or even in many places, majority, uh, for the most part, dependent upon public funding for disaster. We're, we're lucky. We have a, we collect about, the Catholic community in the United States supports us to the tune of about $150, $160 million a year. That gives us a pretty deep pocket to respond immediately where another organization may have to wait till to do a to do a fundraising drive or to wait for a government to 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 release a, a call for proposals or something. So we tend to we tend to be in a lot of these places and have been there for decades. So we, we don't arrive two days after the disaster happens. So that tends to give us a, a leg up. And and others is certainly not just us, but those of us who who are there, you, you tend to know the territory better. Uh, you get a little bit of a jump on things, you know people, you know how the system works, and so I think that uh, uh, certainly helps us uh, not only get off the mark more quickly, but probably uh, get, up for, get off the mark more effectively as well in terms of our programming. But yeah, there's a lot of sharp elbows in, in these rooms, particularly in meetings with donors, is that it tends to be uh, the money is quick out the gate, and it and, and if you don't get it on the first round, say within the first month, you're probably not likely to get it. So it, it is a it is a, a competition. We don't, you know, some people cringe at the word using our competition, but it you know it's reality. It very much is a competitive a competitive field, especially in the bigger ones. I mean, there's nobody competing to do anything in the northeastern states of India because um, nobody knows about what that's going on. But particularly those which are highly covered by the news media. The money follows, the sharp elbows follow that. So yeah, it's sort of the down, the senior, the downside of, uh, of, this, of this whole work is, is its competitive, competitive side. And there's a real culture clash, because especially with the corporate coming in, and these hybrids coming in, and they just do business really, really different than we do. Their whole approach, their business model is just really different, and so there's very much a clash of, 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 of those sort of ethos. So, I mean, so that, for me, that begs the question then, 
do you ever find yourself partnering with someone, maybe the other long-term engineers? Yes. Okay, so, so it's just this, these, these new hybrids. Well, often, often we so end up partnering with them that? because we're forced to, because the U.S. government lets out a contract opportunity for fifty million dollars, and one of the and the and one of the ways they deal with that is sort of say we're letting you on if you want in on it, work out your differences or leave at the door or something, but but work to you'll figure out if they so they, they force a uh, they force collaboration if you will, where it's it's uh, mo uh, motivated from outside as opposed to as opposed to inside. But yeah, we often work with Save the Children in Oxfam. There's a, there is a division of labor. Um, CRS is known for, uh, Oxfam is known for water and sanitation in emergencies. CRS is known for what we call non-food item distribution, also for food distribution. So over the years, different organizations have come to be known for uh, different specializations. That doesn't mean we don't do water and sanitation. And it doesn't mean that Oxfam doesn't do what I described we doing, but it means that sort of the reputation is sort of centered around these things. So there's quite a bit of, you know, okay, you do this in that village, we'll do this in that village, but we'll take that village for that. There's, there's quite a bit of that. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, these uh, non-governmental militias like Hezbollah and Hamas and so on. The other thing that's happened over the uh, last several years is uh, these distributed uh, cells like Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. appearing in many different countries. How do you deal with that? So they tend to not be, uh, they tend to be more subterranean uh, than, than Hamas or Hezbollah. I mean, Hamas is the government uh, of, of Gaza. Hezbollah basically controls the government of of, of Lebanon, except for Hassan Nasrallah himself, a leader who's like in hiding. It's not difficult to find Hezbollah officials. So you can deal with them, if, but who knows where these these other um, more subterranean groups are. We, I mean, they, they, they have an impact on us, but we can't really, we can't really deal with them directly because just of their nature. But do you have some type of intelligence or shared intelligence with the US government? No, 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 no. I mean, this is something we're really very sensitive about, is, is being co-opted uh, even, and this is where we have to leave behind some of our naivete, uh, because um, the U.S. government or, or others would be very happy to use organizations such as ours as fronts, um, as identity fronts for individuals, but also uh, using us as sources of information. Um, and this is one of the reasons why governments like Pakistan uh, want control uh, of our movements, because they don't want us going into active war zones. It certainly explains the position of the Assad regime towards NGOs in Syria, which is not new since that war began. That position of that regime has been that way for as long as I've been involved in it when we were trying to help Iraqi refugees long before the Syrian civil war started, the government was just as tight as it is now. Uh, and it's because of the fear that, and so we're sensitive to that uh, uh, and afraid of it because this is you know, a great way to get yourself kicked out. I believe Save the Children is in Pakistan, is now been reduced to one, maybe two people uh, because they've been, uh, associated, whether correctly or not, I don't know, it's not clear, uh, with the doctor who conducted the polio campaign, which got the DNA of Osama bin Laden in Nevada, or something. And, you know, whether he worked for them or whether it was their campaign and he happened to be around, who knows? But you can see where where this can go. And so, yeah, we have to be, be very, very careful of, of be not only used by militias and local government, but even even our own. And it's happened in the past. I mean, this is not just a, a dreamed up threat. This has certainly happened. And, and organizations have been co-opted um, overtly and covertly to, to participate in bigger enterprises that because of the, the cover it provides, the number of them in the field, and their, so their breadth and their depth. And it's a very, it's a very concerning, uh, concerning thing. We have essentially have a corporate security department that, that deals with 
the obvious security threats, but one of the concerns is, is also this one, because this is a huge reputational risk were it to be breached. Great. I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut this off. Uh, thank you very much, Mark.